Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your patience. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Sexuality, Gender, and Identity Resources, Guiding Students to Primary source Sources, which is sponsored by Gail Sengage. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the left-hand side, you will see a chat panel that you can use to submit questions or comments. We will spend some time responding to your questions at the end of the program, so please feel free to submit these throughout. You will also see a separate box for technical questions. Please feel free to use this feature for any technical difficulties you may be experiencing so our production team can troubleshoot them privately. And finally, please note that today's program will be recorded and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access the archived version. Our speakers today are Dr. Jen Mannion and Bethany Dotson. Dr. Mannion is the author of Liberty's Prisoners, Carceral Culture in Early America, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2015, and is co-editor of Taking Back the Academy, History of Activism, History as Activism, published by Rutledge in 2004. Dr. Mannion has also published essays in Signs, Journal of Women in Culture and Society, Journal of the Early Republic, TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, and Radical History Review. Bethany Dotson has worked at Gale for five years, and her current title is International Marketing Manager. At this point, we're ready to get started, so I will turn the floor over to you, Bethany. Thank you very much, Mark, and we're very happy to be here today. As you can tell from our bios, I am not the main feature. Um, we're all very excited to be here today um, to hear from Dr. Mayan. I wanted to go quickly through the agenda and make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what you can expect from today's webinar, and then we'll jump right in. So today we're going to be covering and diving into, um, with Dr. Mannion, two main Gale resources, as well as doing a quick survey of other online LGBT resources. Um, I'll give a brief, uh, no more than 10 minute overview of these, um, just for some background, and then I'll hand it off to Dr. Mannion. Uh, she's going to talk, as I said, about a few other online resources, um, talk about some search tips, and then go into a live demo to explain different search strategies um, and different ways that the content in these databases can be used within a gender studies curriculum. So without further ado, um, these two digital source um, archives that we're discussing today are part of the Gale Primary Sources Program. You may be familiar with us. You may be familiar with the program under its former name, Gale Digital Collection but you will hopefully know us um, in terms of research and teaching. So these primary source collections we've been doing for many years. Um, and it's important to note today that all of the resources that we're showing are available um, for digital humanities research. And what I mean by that is we are happy to deliver on request the data and metadata behind these archives. So not only are they useful uh, for student and faculty research in the databases themselves, but we're happy to provide that data and metadata for more computational analysis. Um, we'll be showing you both how to use these databases as one-offs as well as cross-searching them. Um, and Jen will be highlighting some of the textual analysis tools featured in the database. So really quickly here, the first archive that Dr. Manning is going to be showing is LGBTQ History and Culture Part 1. You may have seen this launch earlier this year, and this is part of a program that we're very excited about, the Archives of Human Sexuality and Identity. The archives in this program feature the LGBT community over many centuries, um, and this particular part that is now available highlights primary sources since 1940. These are personal papers, newsletters, organizational records, periodicals, governmental documents um, from more than 35 countries. A large collection, more than a million and a half pages, um, and we're excited to make that available for study. 
that what's coming next in this program. We have several more parts um, at the very least. The next one will be coming out just the beginning of 2017. That will be a continuation of the same time period and will represent other L even more diverse LGBTQ communities. So this includes a regional highlight, more international content, um, and some of the underrepresented and diverse communities from this time period. Then the next part, as you can see here on the screen, I won't read you all of this, um, covers an earlier time period in the emergency of sexualities. So this is the arguably the underpinnings of the LGBTQ movement, it includes erotic literature, uh, a broader focus on, quote, deviance, um, and some health and medical issues and documents as well. Um, finally, uh, in 2018, we'll be releasing early modern sexuality and gender, focusing on the 17th and 18th century, including legal history and personal papers. If you have any questions about any of that, um, feel free to put them in the chat box. I believe that Adam mentioned that we will be addressing questions at the end, um, and I will be providing my email address and contact information if you have any more detailed questions about that content. The selection of materials for this program is guided by an academic advisory board, and you'll see their names um, and titles and affiliations here. Um, the qualifications for our board members are pretty straightforward. Um, we've put together a board of people who represent a variety of roles. Some teach, um, some are more invested in research, others come from the library world, um, and these board members work together with us toward a common goal, to bring together unique and valuable content in ways that tie to research and education workflows. So these individuals will be guiding the program over the next three years, um, and we look forward to seeing where they take the program. So going back to part one, this LGBTQ history and culture since 1940, this is a brief overview of the kinds of documents that you'll find and that you'll see Jen demonstrate today. Um, surveys and research in homosexual reform, uh, material documenting arts, uh, nonprofit organizations, legislation covering all topics. So you can see the broad range of uh, curriculum applications here in terms of more legal applications, sociology, political science, of course, women's and gender studies, um, and other humanities. There's a wide appeal here in the range of content and topics covered. The second collection that Jen is going to be going through today um, is Crime, Punishment, and Popular Culture. This is a collection that covers an earlier time period, as you can see, um, and includes more of the crime-focused um, aspect. So looking at this through a different lens. This collection documents the beginning of the police force, sort of the beginning of our, our current understanding of criminal justice, and includes things like trial transcripts, um, popular dime novels, with the fascination with crime, uh, broadsides, monographs, both the factual side in terms of um, factual documents, legal documents, as well as the, the popular culture fascination with crime and, and criminals. So this is also an international collect collection, including content in more than eight languages. Um, and it's sourced from places like the British Library, uh, the National Archives in the UK, the American Antiquarian Society, the Library of Congress, um, the State Library of Queensland, all over the world. And we, the academic advisor for that collection, is Dr. Lucy Sussex at La Trobe University in Australia. That collection as well includes things um, like police guides and instructions, uh, materials that are more related to criminal justice, as well as those more related to history, literature, sociology, of course, women's and gender studies, which is the side of that collection that we'll explore today. So Jen, um, without further ado, would you like to talk about other resources that are available online in terms of LGBT studies and, and some of the searches that you're going to take us through today? Uh, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Jen Mannion. Uh, the first uh, resource listed here um, is now in a digital archive, but it was based on um, an actual in-person exhibit that the library company of Philadelphia did from their collection of primarily 18th and 19th century uh, publications. It's very pioneering, um, and I hope in the future these are the kinds of sources that Gail is going to incorporate into its third and fourth um, phases of our project. 
Uh, the second one, the Digital Transgender Archive, is, I believe it just premiered this year. Uh, it's very wide-ranging, and I also use this uh, with students in my class um, to introduce them to important, obscure, uh, and early uh, records uh, from the transgender community. Uh, the third one, I think, is a helpful guide for students and librarians uh, that the National Archives in the UK put together um, because, as is the focus for our conversation today, figuring out how to find histories of LGBTQ people or even non-normative gender and sexuality more broadly uh, for the early period uh, can be very challenging. And so uh, it's, a, it's a guide to that specifically with a list of keywords. So there are just some other sources that I find helpful in my work. Uh, what you see here now are some keywords that I put together for our project today. Uh, specifically, uh, we'll work on with some of these uh, when we look at the first database. Uh, the first half, uh, you know, of this list are basic common terms that we use in the community and and some that people use uh, to describe us. Uh, if you just are looking for general overviews, uh, representations of articles or documents, say, about bisexuals or about pansexuals. Uh, and once you get further down the list, you'll see um, some more specific terminology reflecting some subcultures uh, that if you're not in the community, you might not be familiar with, uh, but that I think actually would allow you to jump right in uh, to some of the really exciting, interesting, unique documents uh, that are there. So I just put here is a combination of pretty well-established basic terminology and then also some uh, less commonly uh, known about ways of getting at our community. And then here you'll notice uh, a pretty different list, and I put together this list of keywords um, as a way uh, to do what we might think of as a needle in a haystack kind of search. Um, whereas the first database, uh, the LGBT archives, are records from LGBTQ organizations about our movement explicitly, uh, the Crime Punishment Popular Culture Database is not explicitly or intentionally about us at all. And because of the periodization, you'll notice that significantly different terminology uh, is used to refer to us. And so this is something I think you also need to prepare students for, that a lot of them uh, can be offensive and derogatory. Um, but that is part of um, I, what I think is an important opportunity and experience for students um, in studying the history of gender and sexuality. And so uh, these terms are used in sometimes predictable and sometimes unpredictable ways, uh, but they allow us to get at some of the similar questions, uh, maybe not about LGBTQ people explicitly or our communities, uh, but m about maybe broader questions about how people with unconventional or non-normative gender um, or who engage in same-sex acts or desires were thought of, were treated, uh, were represented in the press. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, I think at this point, if you'd like to share your screen or let me know if you have any difficulties. Okay. Is my screen up? It is. OK, uh, what you see here uh, is a list of Gale databases. And I'm just going to scroll down. Oh, did I scroll past it already? Um, to the first one I'm going to focus on here, the archives of 
human sexuality and identity. The first thing that I do in using this with students is go up uh, and, and click on Explore Collections, just so that we can get a, a quick overview of what kind of records are here and from which kind of sources. If you just do a casual scan of these, and I'll leave this up so people can see, I think there are, I identify three major trends um, in what is available here. Um, one are some early records from the 1950s uh, about the Mattachine Society, uh, the Hall Carpenter Papers, the Daughters of Belitis, early homophile movement records uh, for students who are interested in learning about the community and activism, uh, what we would say, quote unquote, before Stonewall. The other thing that is unusual is the representation of lesbian records. And most of these look like they're from the Lesbian History Archive. Uh, but because we know that lesbian activism and communities are generally underrepresented in the mainstream history narratives, it's especially rich and I think a great opportunity uh, for students to tap into these records here to learn more about lesbian history and community. And then the other thing, of course, um, are quite a few collections and records about HIV AIDS, um, the crisis from a medical perspective, organizing, uh, you see at the bottom, uh, the records uh, from the Bush administration um, about the crisis. So I'm going to dive more deeply into a couple of these uh, here. I'm just going to scroll back to the top. So one of the ways that I like to just get a foothold in this is to search up top here, and this is going to search all of the collections. So if I just put in HIV, it's going to search all of the collections here. And on the left, I can see the three main different types of sources, which I think is also something helpful to point out to students, uh, monographs, manuscripts, and newspaper articles. There's an overwhelming number of references um, to HIV in the newspaper articles. And one of the ways that I approach this work and that so many people, especially in gender women's studies, do is through a lens that we say intersectionality. Um, so I might just jump right in here um, and search to see within the results about HIV how many of them, for example, concern African Americans. So it's a dramatically smaller number of records. Um, but for students trying to figure out uh, research topics or paper topics, it's, just, it's also an easy way just to narrow their focus down and, and present them with a, a manageable uh, quantity of material. And here we can just see some of the different sources available. Or look the manuscripts. So let's click here on this document, the impact of HIV on communities of color. When you click on a document, you can also see who published it, in this case, the National Minority AIDS Council, and also what collection it's in. And so here I can see this is a 65-page document. And I think it's, it's obvious, uh, it should be obvious, I think even to students who might not be familiar with the topic, that this is a very important document um, if you're trying to learn about, uh, obviously, the impact of HIV on communities of color at this time, but a blueprint for the 90s. So this kind of document is going to be much more uh, policy, political, 
uh, possibly representing uh, the grassroots community and movement, um, which is likely going to be very different from the kind of sources that we find if we go down to newspapers. and periodicals, which would just cover a, a much wider range of angles. And so this is just, this is from a publication in Raleigh, North Carolina in the 1990s, talking specifically about the, the relationship between the African American church and the HIV AIDS epidemic. So uh, a lot of students, I think, are, when they think about the LGBTQ movement, one of the things that they are interested in is protests. So I'm just going to jump to another topic uh, to get us a, a different set of records here. And there's this feature called term clusters, which is another way, if you're not sure exactly how you want to, what angle you want to take to look at protests, you click on the term clusters, and it shows you the other words that appear near your search words, so protest. So you see ACT, which is about ACT UP, protest march, gay protest aid. Actions, demonstrations, zaps. I'm curious about this. Um, and here I see that there are several clippings about uh, the demonstration at St. Pat St. Patrick's Cathedral. I think this is a great example of how working with primary source documents it just introduces students so quickly to such a wide range of issues and incidents. Um, And I know very few of my students are familiar with this uh, aspect of uh, the, the, the history of our community, and especially in um, protesting for better education awareness around HIV AIDS. And so this just looks like this is from the New York Public Library collection. Okay, another angle. So when I'm in a specifically LGBTQ archive, I tend to put in unconventional phrases that really seem like they have nothing to do with our community to try to access information about our subculture. So here I put in music, right? And let me see, did that work? Yeah. Okay. And so part of the, you know, opportunity and also challenge of working with these kinds of sources is a lot of different records will come up in response to a keyword search, and some of them might be generative and exactly what you're looking for and some of them might not be. Um, here I see information about the Michigan Women's Music Festival, um, and if you're familiar with the women's community and lesbian feminism, you know this is both uh, centrally, central and important and also uh, controversial and transphobic. So uh, I know this is a, a new, uh, something that some of my students have been interested in uh, researching uh, more recently to understand uh, that history and that tension and how we got to this current moment. So this looks like an advertisement. Okay, the final search I'm going to do in this database um, is something that you know, I think a lot about my work uh, as I work at the intersection of the carceral state and sexuality. Um, and so I put in the word police. And I think this is something 
uh, that people have been talking about more recently, uh, given the Black Lives Matter movement and the debate over police violence in America today, uh, which is what is the history with the LGBTQ community um, and the police? Um, that for much of our history, um, we were targeted. And, and so here there's records on hate crimes, and some of this, of course, is uh, also uh, spotlighting uh, the records uh, from England. Here you see uh, within the records of the Daughters of the Leaders. Uh, so this is in San Francisco. Uh, so the, an early lesbian feminist organization was uh, keeping records about police oversight, uh, that this was important enough uh, to the work that they're doing, that this was uh, in their archives. Here's an interesting intersection, uh, uh, a memo from the Latino Democratic Club membership about police issues in the Mission District Police Station. So I think this is an especially timely topic uh, that students would get a lot from. I could search within this and put in violence and limit my search of police to police violence. Some similar records and then also uh, something different here in the newspapers and periodicals. So this is from New York in 1991. And you can see anti-gay violence doubles police accused of gay bashing. So one of the great things about working with newspaper sources, of course, is it gives you all of these other uh, references. So uh, just by scanning the first paragraph, I see there was a wave of anti-lesbian gay violence in New York City and much of the nation at this time, that the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force is involved, the New York City Gay and Lesbian Anti-Violence Project, the New York City Police Department Bias Unit. So these are three organizations. Um, students might not, not even know that the latter two um, existed. And so uh, what a different way for students to learn about LGBTQ life in the 19, early 1990s uh, by doing it through this lens. So I could then take these organizations and search and track what they were doing around this issue at this time. I'm going to jump over to the other collection now. So it's just above the archives, the crime punishment and popular culture um, from 1790 to 1920. Now, just by the periodization alone, you might wonder and worry uh, how we're going to find records um, about LGBTQ people. Uh, this is one of my favorite parts about teaching students uh, the history of sexuality through primary sources. Um, because in some respects, things are completely different. Uh, and in other ways, uh, there are a lot of connections and through lines uh, that and similarities. So I start the same. I look at uh, the collection level. And again, you know, this collection was not put together uh, with the LGBTQ community or even gender and sexuality in mind. Uh, but this is the way that I like to do this kind of research. I'm uh, more excited about the needle in the haystack uh, approach to try to help recover, reclaim, reconstruct, redefine um, our place in a longer history. So I'm going to jump in one of the collections that I've worked more extensively with. <clears throat> there are two separate collections here, uh, side by side, from the American Antiquarian Society, uh, the, the Literature Reports and True Crime is uh, phenomenal. And searching within this collection now, I could look at, of course, the list of 
terms that I provided uh, at, the, at the beginning. So I'm not going to search for gay man or homosexual necessarily, but I am going to put in sodomy um, because sodomy is one of the ways that we find uh, records of men who had sex with other men in the early period um, is through criminal and court records of people who were charged with sodomy. And so the same thing here, manuscripts uh, and monographs. I'm going to jump over to the term cluster just to see what's here. Not much. So one of the things that we also have to remind students is that this represents uh, the collection itself, right? So there's a disproportionate number of official state prison reports and reports of inspectors. And that's why these words dominate in the clusters. It's, it's, so sometimes the term clusters are not generative, and sometimes they are. But again, for me, that, I, that gives me the opportunity to challenge the students to think through what does it mean, why is it significant that in order to find records of uh, men who loved and had sex with other men during this period, um, we have to go through these institutional records, that, that that's one of the most um, common places that their lives are featured. I've been working in this collection a lot from my current, uh, what I call my transgender history project. Um, but of course, if I put in the word transgender, you'll see nothing comes up, right? So I've identified a list of terms that are were frequently used during the period to describe people who cross genders uh, in different ways. And so one of them is male attire. OK. And so this is one place where newspapers uh, and periodicals uh, are particularly rich. And you can also see over here to the left of the, the periodization um, of the search results. Um, but I'm just going to jump right here into this. OK, so this is from 1889, the date in the collection up top. I realize I've been going very quickly, so why don't I Slow down for a minute and let people actually enjoy this document. So uh, one of the things that, of course, um, the, the exciting part about uh, cutting students loose in these archives is that they just never know what they're going to find. Um, and so sometimes these accounts of uh, women uh, dressing in male attire are incredibly heteronormative and uh, related to flirting with men or their husbands. Sometimes they seem incredibly transgressive. Um, and I think there's a lot of room for interpretation in, in reading these. and so. Uh, I encourage students to read a group of these. And we can see, I don't know how different this one is. And try to identify themes and, 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 and come to their own uh, sense of what it means and how it relates to other questions um, in queer theory and gender studies that we think about a lot in the present. So here, this is a rather typical account that I find, especially earlier in the 19th century. Um, uh, in Cleveland, a woman dons bloomers and pebbles papers. Uh, we're startled by a woman appearing on the street in male attire selling newspapers. She decides that it was better to dress mannish and make a livelihood than to be feminine and to starve. So this raises questions about opportunities for women's work. It also challenges us to think about uh, the difference between uh, people who were assigned 
the female sex at birth and then really presented them as, themselves as male and lived in past as male uh, versus people who uh, may have identified as women and just put on male attire. Uh, so STDs, uh, their movement in the world and their economic prospects. So I just put in the term invert, uh, which becomes a commonly used phrase in sexology uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, in reference to gender unconforming people and homosexuality. Um, it doesn't really have results um, for this, which I think mostly speaks to the periodization of the records that are here, um, but also the types of records. And so I think this is um, a topic that is going to be covered, will be covered much more extensively in part three of the collection. I just forgot. Another word uh, that I might put in here is breaches. Uh, and so she wore the breeches uh, was a commonly used phrase in the 18th century uh, to refer to a woman who was out of place, um, who took over the man's role in the house or in society. Sometimes it is also used um, in reference to people who cross gender. Here's an example from the National Police Gazette, and this is 1889. And so one of the things that we do know um, is starting, I think, in the 1870s, there's an increasing um, regulation of people crossing gender, especially uh, people who were, are identified as women who live in past as men, the criminalization of that practice. And so these kind of accounts increasingly show up in things such as uh, the National Police Gazette. So this is a very different article than the one we clicked on um, under uh, male attire. Here we have an account of um, a man charging that his wife refused to perform her household duties. And a charge that she assaulted him. And it says it also has a picture. Let me see what the picture is. OK. So this is typical for this publication. There are often exaggerated, sensationalized images, um, which is another great way that students um, can engage with this material. And so this, I believe the National Police Gazette is uh, known for this. I'm going to jump back now. Where, where do I want to go? I want to add, I want to do search both databases together and then we can look a little bit about change over time. So if I click on the Artemis primary sources, it should give me the option of clicking several of the databases. So I'm going to uncheck all and I'm just going to check the two that I've been working in, and search primary sources. Now, here I'm going to put in the word queer um, and see how that fares. OK, so on the left, I can see the breakdown of source type. Quite a few monographs and manuscripts, uh, but uh, abundance of newspapers and periodicals. It also shows me which collection those findings are coming from. And here, I'm going to go down here because I want to see the time spread of the results. 
So maybe I, I might need to go do this somewhere else. Here, let me see term frequency. Sorry about that. Okay. And I think I can narrow this, right? So, okay, so from 1850s, there is a steady, small but steady, usage of the word queer in a range of sources. And then, of course, when we get to the 1970s, uh, the emergence of uh, you know, the more modern activist LGBTQ community, uh, we, more people using the term queer, uh, we see a dramatic spike. Um, so it looks like it peaks in 1996. And I love that function. Or you just have to remind students again that it's 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 representative of the collection itself. Not it doesn't necessarily mean that people were using the word queer in 1996. Astronomically more um, in society, but that in, that's what is represented in the collection. But anyway, uh, so a range of sources here. Uh, this looks like the gay community news from Dublin in the UK. Queer history. I got a book. Okay. Okay, so I just wanted to see if there was something meaningful uh, in the clusters, queer history, a little bit. Well, let me try a new phrase. Oh, what I was uh, hoping to get at, but uh, the word, uh, it's a great project for students to study history of the use of the word queer uh, in different types of sources. And, it is something that you can do with this database, although I did not just illustrate it. And we talk and think a lot about the word gender. Uh, and again, if you look over here, you'll see very few results from the crime and punishment. Um, and very many results um, from the archives of human sexuality and identity. And so when you pair these collections together, one of the things that you can look at is a time of transition, right? And so what does it mean that this word gender, which we use all the time in the history of sexuality and gender and studies and feminism, um, which becomes such a catch-all phrase for so many different things, was scarcely even used um, during the early period. Uh, but I will take this as an opportunity to look here, uh, this record here, the Symposium on Gender Identity. So this, not surprisingly, is from the more modern collection. It's about activism from the Hall Carpenter Archives. And it was a symposium on gender identity. So the opportunity for students to do research on early transgender rights 
organizing is phenomenal. And I think along with uh, lesbian history, it is one of the real gems uh, that the Archives of Human Sexuality and Identity is going to support. And just going through a range here. And it's no surprise from our earlier search that uh, the earlier database didn't come up at all um, when I put in uh, the word transgender. Should I? Uh, I think this is a good time for me to pause. You, we do have some questions. Um, if you'd like to wait until. Um, if you have anything else, you can certainly go ahead with that. Or if you like, I can give you some of the questions. Sure. Why don't we take some questions? OK. Um, the question, first question was related to the slide that you sh or the sh slide that we showed regarding different terms that are useful um, for search. The question was, how quickly do these terms change or get stale? Um, or are these terms, or which terms, have staying power um, would be useful for putting on a libguide, for instance? You know, it just really depends on the period that you're talking about. So yes, in contemporary life, we know that our community um, adds language uh, to describe ourselves quite frequently. Um, so it's always changing. Um, but you can look at the list that I gave, read some other uh, secondary literature in the history of sexuality, and you will see that there are patterns that most of these terms um, have a kind of staying power for a certain number of decades, really. And very few transcend uh, 300 years. Mm -hmm. OK. And a, a somewhat related question. Um, this person would be interested to learn if any subject analysis or thesaurus work has been done that might be available to new researchers in the field. Uh, I'm sorry, can you ask that again or explain it to me? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll reread the question. And if the person okay. who wrote the question um, has any follow-up, uh, that would be fine as well. The question is, this person would be interested to learn if any subject analysis or thesaurus work had been done um, that might be available for new researchers. Um, I'm sorry. I just don't um, know that. I just don't know the answer to that. OK. If anybody else would like to chime in in the chat, um, we can crowdsource the answer if anyone knows it. And then we have um, several product questions for Jessica, um, which we can uh, we can address now, or actually I think we may save those for the end, Jen, if you'd like to continue. OK. Um, I just thought uh, another term uh, that might have some interesting yields across both platforms is the phrase Amazon. Um, it is a word that was used in the early early period. Um, you can see here um, in the current punishment popular culture uh, database had 200 hits. Um, it's used in varying ways to describe some kind of women. Um, let's see, uh, rebelling against some kind of convention. Amazon sluggers. I'm not sure what this is, but let's just see. This is from 1890, again, the National Police Gazette. So it's, uh, in this case, it's, you know, it's, it's referring to women who were allegedly um, in a fight. So it has a derogatory turn, uh, tone to it. Uh, women who are doing something that women weren't supposed to do, women who are aggressive. Uh, women who are violent. Um, anyone who is familiar uh, with uh, the history of the lesbian community or lesbian feminism would not be surprised uh, knowing that that word, uh, let me see, I lost myself, has also been used uh, to, to critique people in the more recent past uh, for doing similar things. So it looks like I lost my. Um, other database here to show the range. Uh, 
Uh, but in some respects, I think uh, searching the word Amazon across platform and across time, you might find uh, some real continuity. And of course, here we have an example. It looks like these records from the Amazon Media Project. Yeah, I just very quickly interpret this as probably uh, a group of women reclaiming Amazon as a derogatory uh, word uh, and meant to signal strength and power and something awesome. And so you can read about this organization, the Amazon Music Party from the 1970s, which is awesome. So I'm happy to uh, stop there and take any other questions that people might have. OK. I actually have a, a growing list of questions for Jessica. So for those of you um, listening, Jessica Balmerito is sitting next to me. She is the product manager um, for both of these products, actually, and is, uh, is my resident expert for these. Um, before I ask her the first one, one question that came up was, how might you receive a trial? Um, so that faculty can take a look at the resources as well. We will be sending out a follow-up communication in the next few days that you'll receive um, via email that will include a trial link, uh, which you are, are free to share with your faculty. If you are looking for something that's more long-term, uh, where you would like to preview this resource perhaps uh, for a month over the summer, we can get you in touch with our, your sales rep. Uh, if you reply to that email or contact me, um, we'll put my contact information up on the screen here in a second. Um, I'd be happy to put you into contact with your, your Gale rep. Jessica, um, first question, does download get the whole doc or just the current page? So hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, the, so when you choose the download function, you have a few options. You can download your current page. Um, you can download a selected pages, a range of pages. Um, all pages, and you can also download the OCR text. Um, following off of my mentions for of the metadata and data, um, it does and does not come with um, in terms of that question. We can do internet authenticated delivery of that, and then as you can see, you can also access that um, through the database. So Jessica mentioned the availability to download the OCR, um, so that is both things. You can download the OCR on a document-by-document document basis. Um, in regard, I believe, to the archives of sexuality and identity, um, does the database include letter zines, uh, like small print amateur zines? So it doesn't include those specifically. Um, the database does include over a thousand publications, and those range from uh, community newsletters that may have been um, you know, produced over a period of months, or um, as well as major publications with long runs. The, the question was, what has been done by Gale to help new users access some, this material? Obviously, some of what we're encountering today is um, different words or verbiage to describe the same community. Um, is there anything that we have done um, to build in thesauri or otherwise connect terms um, to, to bring some of these to light? Yeah, so we do have a whole group that does subject indexing, and that um, is an ongoing process that so the product is uh, continually improved. Um, and um, so that, that'll be ongoing um, to increase uh, search success from students. All right. Um, the next question was how you could get a fact sheet or something related to um, Gail Artemis. Um, you can certainly send me an email um, so that I have your contact information. Um, Adam, if you could put that last slide back up on the screen, that would be wonderful. Here. So this is me. Um, send me an email. I'd be happy to send you some material and put you in touch with your sales rep for additional help. Question for Jessica. Uh, are pearls available for direct linking to source material? You mean a, a permanent link by that? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so yeah, they are. Um, if you are in the product and you uh, bookmark a page, um, you can share that link, um, and people are able to get back to that, that individual link within the product. If they don't have product access, they won't get any further, but you are able to create those links and share those links. Question for you, Jen. Um, besides the three suggested resources um, on the slide earlier, can you suggest any easily accessible open resources related to LGBTQ history, or for that matter, um, if anyone wants to chime in in the chat box? Yeah, I think uh, outhistory.org, um, I, I actually probably sh uh, should have put that in there. Um, there's a lot of really good primary documents and, you know, second and, and analysis and uh, contributions by a wide range of community members, scholars, activists, and students um, who've been crowdsourcing this work for a while now. So outhistory.org. Um, any recommendations for searching using non-American or non-white American centric terms or sources, um, India or even non-English speaking countries? Jen, I'll give this one to you first and then I'll pass it to Jessica, although she's giving me a face. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the, the time where um, looking at some secondary scholarship that has already been written in the subject. Um, will give you some insight into terminology to use. So hijra, for example, or I put ball culture um, on one of my uh, lists to get at the house and ball subcultures um, that are predominate in North American communities of color. So a stud uh, for, uh, so yeah, if Looking, uh, reading some secondary scholarship uh, will also open the window to how to access the primary sources. I think the challenge is there's so much, there's so many more rich, diverse primary sources available than there are secondary scholarship that has been written about it. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, and you know, in terms of our um, product conceptualization, that we work very closely with advisors. Um, you know, we have the, the group of advisors that were listed on the slide. But then, as we build out the program and as we need different levels of expertise, we uh, seek those out you know, as well, especially for the international material. Thank you. Um, any last questions? I'm aware that we've run a few minutes over time here. I'll stall for a little while if you have any additional questions or resources to share. Um, thank you for that, for those of you who have. Otherwise, you will receive um, an email from us in a few days that will have the recording here as well as your trial link. Please feel free to let me know if anything else comes up, um, if you have any questions or if I can put you in contact. Jen has let us know that she's happy to, to answer any questions as well. Um, and she's easily found if you Google her name online. All right. That's all from me, Adam. Is, is there anything, any other housekeeping that we need to take care of? Hi, Bethany. This is Mark from ACRL and Choice. Um, I'd just like to take a moment to give both you and Dr. Mannion um, a virtual round of applause and thank you so much for spending some time with us today and for sharing all of this wonderful information on these primary sources. Um, it was great to see all of this stuff. As a reminder for everyone else, um, we have recorded today's program so you will receive a follow-up email from Choice as well um, with instructions on how to access the archive version. Thank you to everyone for joining us today and I hope you, en I hope you have enjoyed the session and have an excellent day. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you, everyone, thank for joining. Thank you.